Do me a prayer for other Emma's airway as well. I was telling Will Larry I left my Bible in the van. They have that, so I brought out my ordination Bible. This little letter is a lot, nice, a lot nicer than the fake stuff. <laughs> Let's go to the book of John. I know a familiar portion of scripture for us, John chapter 11. This is, I'd like to look at the first six verses of this chapter. This is where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. I'd just like to look at the, I guess, preceding events to that. When verse number one of John chapter 11 here, the Bible says, Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. <clears throat> Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. <clears throat> now, I think we, like I said, we all know this story, of this account, I guess we could say, of Lazarus being sick and dying, and Jesus going and raising him from the dead. I always like that song that Donna sings about this account where you Three days late, but still on time. Amen. Here we we see where Jesus learns the news of Lazarus being sick. He says, now there was a certain man named Lazarus of Bethany. This is the first mention in scripture of this Lazarus. In fact, he's only mentioned here in chapters 11 and 12 of the book of John. We really don't have any background info on who he was other than he was from Bethany and he was the brother of Mary and Martha, according to verse 2. You know, Bethany was just a little town outside of Jerusalem. Uh, I think in verse 18, it says it was about 15 furlongs. Mm -hmm. That's about two miles. So he, it was a quick trip for Jesus to go over there. And, right. But yet he tarried two days, we see. But here this Lazarus was sick, it says. And this must have been some serious illness mm -hmm. for we see in verse 2 that his sister sent for Jesus to come, or verse 3. But verse 2, John makes a special note here to say that the Mary, his sister, was that Mary which anointed the Lord with women and wiped his feet with her hair. Lazarus was sick. Right. They, it's recorded over in chapter 12 of this where she anointed him and wiped his feet with her hairs. And there is another account of a, a woman in Luke chapter 7 in the house of Simon the leper anointing his feet and wiping his feet with their hair. And right. I don't know if that's the same account, but there is also two accounts in Matthew and Mark and that it's uncertain if that is Mary also, but we do know it was made special note that Mary did this thing. Mm -hmm. that he, she did it for his death, he says. No, I don't know if Simon the leper was lived there close to Mary and Martha, or maybe they all lived at the same house. Mm -hmm. Because even, he went and dined with Simon the leper. That's when the one woman that's unnamed wiped his feet. And he said, you know, that's when he kind of scolded Simon for not even greeting him with a kiss. But this one said, have wiped, or anointed my feet and wiped my feet with her hair. <laughs> But this Mary here was also the same Mary which was found sitting at the feet of Jesus later on. 
And Martha said, I forget exactly how it goes, but she said, well, aren't you going to do something about my sister? She's not helping me. Mm -hmm. And that's when Christ says, Martha, Martha, thou art come about with many cares. We're often more like Martha than Mary, though, aren't we? Right. Too busy with other stuff than just to sit feet of Christ. Amen. And we have verse 3 is where it says, they, Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, you, he whom thou lovest is sick. So here they spend specifically for Jesus to come. You Note know, they mentioned that he whom thou lovest is sick. The Bible doesn't say that just about everyone, does it? Mm -hmm. I think I don't know, that Lazarus and Mary and Martha were, seemed to be close with Christ more than even some of the other disciples that, outside of the twelve. But they specifically say, He whom thou lovest is sick. Certainly, God loves his people, isn't he? Amen. You know, in our thinking, if someone we love is sick, we're going to try to get them better, aren't we? We're going to do what we can physically, we'll pray for them, certainly. But yet we see here the response of Christ wasn't to run over there and heal them real quick, was it? Mm -hmm. Verse 4 says, When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Mm -hmm. How, how could you say it was not on death when Lazarus would die? Because he knew what he was going to do already. God, and of course Jesus being God, he knows the bigger picture, if you will. Sometimes we have, I guess you would say, tunnel vision, don't we? we Amen. We see everything for what it is right in front of us instead of what God is working No, certainly Christ already knew he would go there and he would raise Lazarus from the dead. It's not that he got there and he saw that they were all sad, so I guess I'll do him a favor. Oh, he, could, he said it's not on the death, but for the glory of God. Amen. You know, there's a lot of times things happen in their life, but I think sometimes it's just ultimately for the glory of God. That's it. Turn back to chapter 9 just for a moment. <clears throat> We see this very similar instance here when something was seemingly bad, yet it was just for the glory of God. John chapter 9, the first three verses it says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They were good Baptists, weren't they? <laughs> Something bad happened. They must have been in sin. But Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. Amen. So Jesus was going to show his works in the blind man, and he was going to show it in Lazarus the same way. You know, that sometimes things happen just simply that we might see the glory of God. It's not that we did something bad or did something wrong. I don't think the three Hebrews in Daniel chapter 3 did anything wrong to be cast into the lion for the, yeah. the furnace of fire. Right. Nor Daniel into the lion's den in chapter 6. Yet we see a great display of the glory of God in both of those instances. Don't Amen. Amen. But yes, to the flesh, it seemed a bad thing that Lazarus was sick and was going to die. I'm sure the blind man, it was not enjoyable, and yet he would not have seen the glory of God the same had he not been born blind. You know, we could say Jesus could have ran over there and healed Lazarus, and certainly he would have got the glory out of that. Doesn't it get even more glory of showing his power over death? Amen. Oh, when Jesus, back in verse 4, had heard that he heard as he said, the sickness is not death, but the glory of 
for the glory of God, the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And he goes on to say, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Mm -hmm. It specifically spells out who Jesus loves here, doesn't it? Yeah. Except in all the mentions of Bethany in the scriptures, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are the only ones he says he loves. Right. I said he did eat in Simon Leper's house, but he never says he loved him. I don't know how many people lived in Bethany, but I'm sure it was a few hundred, a few thousand at least. And of all those, there's just these three that he says he loves. Amen. He has this extra special care for, if you will. But we all take great comfort that God loves us as his children. That's right. Amen. So, and I know it's all throughout the scriptures that describes how he loves us as his people. But I think Revelation chapter 1 describes it more plainly than just about anywhere else. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Specifically, verse. Five. And it says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and then him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Amen. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. He loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, he says. I don't think it's any more plain and simple than that, is it? That's that. And if he loved everyone, then he washed everyone from their sins. That's so, so why I can't follow the Armenian teaching that he loves everyone. Or else I'd have to be a universalist and say everyone's going to be saved. <laughs> right. Because whom he loves, he cares for. Amen. Whom he loves, he died for. Whom he loves, he, as it says there, washed sins away in his own blood. That's really a great, I don't know, almost overwhelming thought, just that Jesus loves us and all that comes along with that. Mm -hmm. But one thing we don't think about, and I think this way, kind of led me to this passage here, is sometimes because he loves us, he sends us through difficult times. Mm -hmm. No, I don't have a, there's not a singular answer for that. Sometimes it's for our chastisement. Sometimes it's for our growth, if you will, that we might, our faith to try, that we might draw closer to him. Ultimately, it's always for his glory. Amen. And that ought to be our chief goal, really, is his people's to glorify him, that he would get the glory, not us. Yeah. So when Jesus loved Martha and her, sis and her sister and Lazarus, I said, fleshly thinking, we would think if he loved him so much, he would have you know, there and healed Lazarus. Or you might go as far as say he wouldn't even let Lazarus get sick. Right. Yeah. That's what. Well, why did God let this happen? That's what I hear all the time nowadays. But like I said, I don't know all the workings of God, but I know all things are working together for the good of them that love them. Amen. I know ultimately all things are working together for His glory as well. You're right. Notice verse number 6 here. It says that when He had heard, therefore, that he was sick. He abode two days still in the same place where he was. You know, it wasn't that he was tied up or that he was hindered, but he purposely carried there for two days. So, uh, we sometimes think of God as a genie in the Bible, but grant our wishes. That's not how the God of the Bible works. That's not how Jesus right. operates. He said he works on his timetable and really according to his plans, not ours. Like I said, I'm sure 
Mary and Martha, when they sent for Jesus, they were thinking he was going to come on over there and heal up and all would be well. And there wouldn't have been wrong, like I said, but their faith would not have been tried the same way. Right. They wouldn't have seen the great power of God over death if he had done that. I know it's easy to be on this side of the story, but when we're in the same situation, we ought to remember that God still is very much in control. Amen. You know, I, you know mind, I'm going to read something from Brother Pink that I read recently. He was actually writing on the expedition with John, and he says, Blessed be God, it is our privilege to be assured that the hand of death did not strike us down before God's predestinated hour arise for us to go hence. The enemy may war against us, and he may be permitted to strike our bodies, but shorter lives he cannot need more than he could Job's. Job 2 6. A frightful epidemic of disease may visit the neighborhood in which I live, but I am immune until God suffers me to be affected. Amen. Unless it is his will for me to be sick or die, no matter how the epidemic may raise, nor how many of those around me may fall victims to it, it cannot harm me. Amen. But on the other hand, if he so wishes for it to come to your way, it will come your way. Mm-hmm. You're right. You know, I'm not saying we should go out and be foolish, but we ought not to be fearful either. Amen. It's the same God who protects us can, for lack of better ways, and allow things that come our way as well. We see that very well in the book of Job, don't we? That's it. Mm -hmm. Yet we see very well that Satan himself is under control of God, that he can only do as much as God allows him to do. Amen. I like another thing that Pink says in another place. So Satan could not so much as touch a hair of our head without the direct permission of God. Amen. So yes, we may be like Lazarus was here and sick unto death. Yet God is still very much in control of what's going on. Isn't it? And we may say, well, God, I, I pray that you would heal me of this and yet you have us. Or, God, I pray that you help me through this, and yet you haven't. That's it. We, we get tunnel vision, if you will. We expect God to work right here and right now. Don't look at what maybe he's working the bigger picture. So I'm sure the and I, as Ryan Michio, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we call them, or would have been very satisfied if God would have delivered them from the hand of Nebuchadnezzar and they wouldn't even have to go down there to the furnace. Right. They were content to burn there as well. Right. I don't, know, I don't think any of us have reached that place of trusting in God, have we? Yeah. That we could say, well, if He would deliver us. But if not, we know we will not bow down. Yeah. Well, they were completely submissive to whatever God would have for them. Amen. Whether it was the a literal furnace of fire or whether it was deliverance. Mm-hmm. Well, Seeing since they got both, didn't they? Yet Daniel very much in the same way. He was, he was casting lines, then he didn't sit over the corner and say, Well, God. If you let this happen to me, that's what we do, isn't it? You know, Martha was a little bit like that, wasn't she? If you keep reading through the story here of Lazarus, she said, Lord, if you've been here, my brother had not died. That's the way we act. We say, oh, God, if you'd done this, this wouldn't have happened. Right. But do we know better than God? I'm reminded of the words of Paul and Romans in the potter. Saying in the clay, why hast thou made me this? Really, who are we to question how and why God does things he does? You're right. Amen. 
Oh, if you're sick and death and he carries two days, we still have praise and fortune. Or if he comes right away and heals you up, we still, you still have praise and fortune. But really, in all things, we ought to see his glory and his honor. Amen. And remember the words in Romans 8 that none of these things can separate us from the love of God. No, not the good times, not the bad times, not even death itself, it says. Amen. Let's turn there and read that and we'll close. Romans chapter 8. song that I kind of fell in love with, but I'm not going to attempt to sing it. But it it's really based on this particular scripture, how nothing can separate us from the love of God. Romans 8, verses find it here. 35, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or stress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Amen. And in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. <clears throat> for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I will be. Amen. And you can be sure if you're one of his, he loves you, and nothing will separate that. That's it. So don't be discouraged like Martha was when hard times come. Rather, just be like Mary and choose that good part. Mm -hmm. So we could we can question God all we want to, but that's not going to do us any spiritual good. Rather, we ought to simply resign ourselves to whatever it may be that He would have us to do, whatever He would situation He would have us to go through. And that song, "A Firm Foundation," I think it's the third verse, which is based out of the Psalms, of which one describes how, though through fiery trials, my pathway shall lie. Let's see, you know those things. Well, those trials will consume us, will they? Amen. Rather, we'll just come out more refined. Sure. That's what trials will do for the child of God. Trials and tribulations for the lost person, they'll make them more hardened, possibly. You're right. But oh, for us that are the children of God, they will refine us. They will grow our faith. They will cause us to see God more and more for who He is, and really see more and more our reliance upon Him. But let us just simply trust in Him no matter what may come our way, whether it's, I said, death, even as Lazarus faced, sickness, whether it's a fiery furnace or lion's den, whether it's some other tribulation or trial. Let us, as Paul says in Corinthians, Romans, do all things to the glory of God. Amen. Let's close with that talk.